Great, fantastic. Hello. This song, so, yeah. This song of the Rose is a good Catalan composer, Manu Guis. He composed it for the musical show about the book The Little Princess. Uh -huh. uh, Pep Poulet is one of the best uh, musicians that we have in Catalonia. And uh, this song, uh, he decided to play in this uh, San Jordi virtual in this virtual San Jordi in New York because it matches everything uh, the Catalan music with the rose which is a, a very important uh, symbol for for this day for San Jordi and uh, together with with the book one of the universal uh, books of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry uh, Le Petit Prince uh, or Petit Prince this is uh, as Pep uh, was telling us one of the uh, central uh, songs of this successful musical that has been on the stages there in uh, Spain and Catalonia for uh, six years uh, until 2014 that it was uh, um, scheduled and it was um, it has been uh, a very very successful um, musical and we decided to play this uh, great song the rose la rosa because it's uh, our our catalan symbol it's just wonderful thank you so much pep and thank you so much marty for that introduction we'll let you go pep thank you so much for joining us today thank you pep gracias thank you <laughs> happy san jordi bon san jordi Moment. So, uh, so it's, I'm going to start with some introductions. Yeah, thank you so much. My name is Gabby Pagefort. I'm editorial director of Amazon Crossing, and I'm here with Catalan author Marti Gironel and Polish English translator Sean Bai to discuss two novels published by Amazon Crossing. Uh, Marti Gironel is a journalist and writer born in Besalu in 1971. His debut work, The Bridge of the Jews, is the best selling historical novel ever written by a Catalan author, selling more than 100,000 copies in Catalan. And he's written several, several other novels set in different periods of Catalan history, including the book we're going to talk about and hear from today, Stars in His Eyes, which was a bestseller at last year's San Jordi Festival, which was not virtual, and uh, also won the prestigious Raymond Lul Prize. After we hear from Marti, we're going to hear from Sean Gaspar Bai, who is a translator of Polish literature. 
including books by, oh, I should have asked for pronunciation guides for everyone who you've ever translated, um, by Lydia Olstolowska, Philip Springer, and Malgorzata Zizdnev. Should Nert. Correct me, Sean. Malgorzata Shane. It's the same trick as Shijepon, but I'm still learning. Right. <laughs> uh, a native of Bucks County, Pennsylvania, Sean studied modern languages at University College London and international studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies. And he spent five years as literature and humanities curator, curator for the Polish Cultural Institute in New York. He won the Asymptote Close Approximations Prize, and he's also the recipient of an NEA translation fellowship. So we're going to do brief readings from each novel, starting with the original language, just so that we can hear what it sounds like, and then the English translation. Uh, okay. Marty, would you like to start us off? Okay. Um, we are in a, uh, one of the Sinatra's, Frank Sinatra's parties, in, uh, in a house in which our uh, character, our main character, John Leon, used to go every night as a waiter, and there, uh, he um, received uh, free lessons of how to move uh, inside this golden Hollywood in which uh, he was uh, going on uh, his own dream. So I'm reading about uh, Jimmy Van Helsen's parties. Jimmy Van Helsen was one of the major composers of all the greatest songs from Frank Sinatra's um, hits, like Fly Me to the Moon, for example. So I'm going there. En Van Heusen, Chet o Chester per als amics, era compositor i lletrista d'en Sinatra. El seu aspecte extern, ruda, no se deia amb la seva personalitat. Era alt i fort, de coll gruixut, el cap rapat i la veu greu eren del tot impropis d'un home de caràcter apable, reconegut per la seva elegància en el vestit i la manera d'expressar-se. Desprenia un magnetisme especial, sobretot entre el sector femení, que el considerava tot un cavaller i que tocava el piano i les dones com volia. Moltes de les festes privades d'en Sinatra se celebraven a casa del músic i allà el León va ser testimoni d'excepció de la intimitat menys glamorosa del Hollywood mitificat. Va veure com estrelles i polítics destacats perdien les formes i la vergonya mentre ell feia gala d'una manera d'estar gens intrusiva, que de seguida va seduir les celebritats. La seva discreció es basava a oblidar el que veia i a callar el que li havia estat confiat. No ho compartia amb ningú, ni tan sols amb la dona, la seva muller. I aquella reserva va acabar aixecant un altre mur en la relació amb la seva esposa. El terreny que guanyava amb els actors i actrius el perdia amb la dona. A la costa oest dels Estats Units van gaudir d'un hivern de clima suau que convidava a celebrar les festes tant a l'interior com a l'exterior. La zona més concorreguda a casa d'en Van Heusen era la terrassa. A la barra improvisada, instal·lada davant de la piscina, en Chet escurava el seu got de Bourbon i donava consells al jove i molt receptiu Jean Leon. No et permetis fer el número com ells. Preocupa't per les teves maneres, tant a dins com a fora de la feina. Procura tenir prou mà esquerra per posar punt final a una discussió. I en cas de conflicte, demana perdó, fins i tot quan tu tinguis la raó. No beguis gaire, ves-te'n aviat de la festa. No siguis el centre d'atenció permanent, però fes-te notar. No intentis persuadir amb les paraules, les coses es demostren amb els fets. No facis res per obtenir reconeixement. Sigui generós, sense esperar res a canvi. No trenquis mai una promesa. Vesteix bé, l'ocasió no importa. No abaixis el llistó per ningú, no jutgis i no et conformis. Sempre es pot millorar. La cavallositat mai passarà de moda. Ah, i la regla d'or és aquesta. Les dames primer, perquè el carisma d'un home es mesura pel somriure de la dona que l'acompanya. And now, if you allow me, I will read, I hope I pronounce it quite well, the translation that you can, uh, that just the same passage in Stars in His Eyes. Van Helsen, Chet or Chester to his friends, was Sinatra's composer and songwriter. He had a gruff appearance that didn't match his personality. Tall and stocky with a thick neck, shaped head and deep voice, he looked more like a rough neck than the puppy dog that he was. He was an elegant dresser with a gift for gap. He was strangely magnetic, especially with the ladies who thought him a gentleman and who played them as easily as he played the piano. Sinatra threw many a private party in Chet's home, and there, Jan got a rare peek into the less glamorous side of the Hollywood myth. He saw stars and political bigwigs lose their grace and their sense of shame. Jan was discreet. He forgot what he had seen and never repeated what he was told, not even to Donna. That reserve put up yet another wall between him and his wife. The ground he gained among the celebrities, seducing them with his unobtrusive manner, he lost with Donna. 
At Van Helsen's house, everybody loved to gather out on the patio. At the bar in front of the pool, Chet would down his usual glass of bourbon and give advice to the very young and receptive John Leon, who soaked in every word. Don't, don't even make a show of yourself like the rest of these clowns. The kid could have written a rule book for making it in Hollywood with all the guidance Van Helsen gave him. Keep an eye on your conduct at work and outside of it. Know your business like the back of your hand so no one can tell you what you are wrong. If you get in a fight, ask for forgiveness, even if you are in the right. Your friendships matter more than your pride. Sorry. Don't drink too much. Leave the party early. Don't hop the spotlight, but don't go unnoticed either. Don't try to persuade people with words. Let your actions speak for you. Don't do anything just for the sake of recognition. Be generous and don't expect anything from it. Never break a promise. Dress nice, regardless of the occasion. Don't lower the bar for anyone. Don't judge and don't compromise. You can always do better. Chivalry never goes out of style. Oh, and then there's the golden rule. Ladies first, you can measure a man's charisma by the smile of the woman on his arm. Beautiful. And thanks to Adrian Nathan West for that great translation, too. He really yes, of course. Job. Sean, would you like to read us to us from Shichepon uh, Svardox, the King of Warsaw? Yeah, I would love to. Um, I'll read a little bit in Polish to start and then uh, more in English. So this is from towards the beginning of the book. Um, in this scene, our, uh, our, our, our gangster boss, Buddy Kaplica, is meeting with his enforcer, Jakob Shapiro, and they're plotting um, the, the killing of uh, the father of our narrator. The, the narrator is called Moises Bernstein, and his father is called Naum Bernstein. Um, so we start in the little coffee shop that the gangsters use as their, as their kind of headquarters, and the first voice that you hear here is, uh, is Kaplica, who's our, our mob boss. Wiesz, Kubusiu, na nalewkach mieszka sobie taki Żydek, Bernstein, Naum Bernstein. Wiesz? Zapytał po chwili Kaplica składając gazetę na stronie z ogłoszeniami drobnymi. Już wiem, panie kaplica, odpowiedział Szapiro i złoży też swoją, rozumiejąc, że czas relaksu do końca i pora wziąć się do roboty. Dziadkowi wydaje się, że może mi nie zapłacić, ciągnął kaplica, nie odrywając wzroku od ogłoszeń drobnych kurierze. Głupi Żydek, skoro mu się tak wydaje. Głupi, zgodził się kaplica, ale ma rację. Nie zapłaci mi ani grosza, bo nie ma z czego. Munia to sprawdził. Nie ma grosza przy duszy ten Bernstein. Nic się z tego nie wyciśnie. Suchej szmatu woda nie poleci, jakbyś nie wykręca. So I'll read in English and uh, take that scene a little bit further. Um, so again, the first voice we'll hear here is, is complete to the boss. You know, Kuba, there's this little Jew who lives on the Lefki Street, Bernstein, now in Bernstein. Ring any bells? asked Kaplica after a moment, folding his paper to show the classifieds page. Sure does, Mr. Kaplica, answered Shapiro, and also folded up his paper, understanding that the time to relax had come to an end, and now he had to get down to business. All right. And this little Jew thinks he doesn't have to pay me, Kaplica continued, not taking his eye off the classifieds in the courier. Dumb little Jew, if that's what he thinks. Dumb, agreed Kaplica, but he's right. He ain't got to pay me a grosh because he ain't got one. Munya checked. This Bernstein hasn't got a grosh to his name. Ain't no squeezing nothing out of him. You get no water from a dry rag unless you wring it tight. Shapiro nodded solemnly, as though sorry to agree that this story didn't have a happy ending. I had no idea that Naum Bernstein, a modest clerk in the Jewish clinic, was in debt to Kaplica. Now not only didn't tell me, kid that I was, that went without saying, but for a long time he didn't even tell my mother. He was in debt because he didn't want to stay a modest clerk, and he'd stumbled upon a business to take over, a rubber goods store on Gansha Street he could lease. He'd borrowed money from his family for the compensation and taken over the business. He was alone in the store from morning until closing. He bent over backward to pay the debt, turning almost no profit, even though business was good. One day, Kaplica came in. He bought a pair of PPG rubber galoshes, chatted amicably with Bernstein, and then told him he had to pay 50s wadis by Shabbos. By this Shabbos and every following Shabbos, for as long as my father was in that store, 
because that was the price of a store on Gasher Street, 50 zlotys for Buddy, every week. On the first Shabbos, Naum paid. On the second, as well. On the third, he didn't pay, because he didn't have it. He came running to beg forgiveness. Shapiro, to stress the gravity of the situation, smashed Bernstein's nose in, and with a broken nose, Bernstein had to solemnly swear that for the week's delay, he'd bring not only a new 50, plus the 50 he owed, but another 25 as penalty. He didn't. He had nowhere to get it. He gave up the store without compensation. Everyone knew the situation he was in, and no one had the intention of covering that cost for him. He hid. He didn't go out during the day. Buddy sent a boy to tell him the interest on the 125 zlotys he owed was 25% a week. I didn't know anything about this. Now Bernstein finally told his family he was sick. He went to bed and waited. Loma Antlofen, pleaded my mother. Loma Antlofen sind erst zimmer Schwester Kolodz und später kann er sich Royal at the America. Loma Antlofen machen, weil nicht keine Sache auf der Welt wird uns keine Verteidigung von Kass von dem Kurz. Let's run away. Let's run away first to my sisters in Wuj, then to the Holy Land or America. Let's run away now, because no power, human or divine, will protect us from the wrath of that rich man. My mother was a pious Jew, but life had taught her that the Lord rarely protected pious Jews from the wrath of Gentiles. My father only shrugged her off and turned his face to the wall. He waited. He didn't run away to Wuj or the Holy Land or America or anywhere else. And finally they came. My mother opened the door, figuring correctly that she might as well save the locks, since there was no saving my father. They took him away. I threw myself on Shapiro, and he brushed me off. Many times afterward, I thought about that moment when I threw myself on Shapiro, who was twice my weight, and hung on his forearm, screaming something in Yiddish. But who was screaming? Shapiro dragged my father out of the apartment by his beard. My father was hunched over like a calf being led to slaughter. I will never have a beard, I resolved then. Hearing my mother's screams and watching clean-shaven Shapiro taking away my one and only father's beard. My own was barely sprouting, but that very day I went to the market. I stole a little money, money from my mother. She saw me take it, but sobbing, she didn't have the strength to protest. I wasn't crying. I went to the market. I got rid of my raggedy coat and shirt and used my stolen money to buy short clothes. Rags, really, but not Jewish rags. Next, I went to a Christian barber. I had him cut off my payas and I asked for a shave. The barber laughed that there was nothing to shave, barely five hairs, but I stood my ground and was paying. So he put a warm towel on my face and rubbed it with oil, mixed the cream with his brush, applied it, shaved me with a couple of sweeps of his hand, rinsed with cold water. I left and saw reflected in the store window the new me, a new better Jew, hair short in short clothes with no payas. Bernstein, I said to my reflection in the voice of Jakob Shapiro, Danesia Zolzan mit Mazel. Good luck, Bernstein. Safe travels. Great. Wow. Very good. Yeah, yeah. A great story. Thank Isn't you. it exciting? And both <laughs> yeah. stories, you know, both of these readings really zoom in on the theme of self transformation, which I think both novels really treat differently. Uh, Marty, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about identity and how Jean Leon shapes his identity. Well, yeah, uh, the story of uh, Stars in His Eyes is how a humble man called Seferino Carrion uh, tried to uh, become another man um, going to the States, the United States, in the shift of the 40s and the 50s and becoming a, a successful man called Jean Leon. He tried to shape, as you use the, the verb, another identity because he was not um, he was not um, very comfortable with uh, his uh, identity there in a um, in a fascist Spain. Uh, we have uh, the Franco regime uh, going on in that way, and he's coming from a Republican family, and he wants to run away of, of this landscape that uh, didn't offer anything to him. And he has uh, dreams, dreams uh, that wants to chase them, to want, they want, um, he and, and, and two, a couple of friends of him uh, wants to, um, to become just another another man, another another kind of guy um, with aspirations, and they 
they believe in their inner strength. And Jean Leon shows me when I was documenting her life, his life, sorry, and uh, his achievements. Um, I I learned that he's uh, struggling against himself uh, because he wants to be another man. He wants to belong to another culture. He wants to get into this culture that uh, Chet, that uh, this Frank Sinatra composer wants to uh, show him how to uh, manage to uh, to understand this world and, and the people that uh, lives in. But he reminds uh, all the novel, uh, his past, his family, his country, uh, all that he has uh, behind him. And there is uh, this is inner struggle between Jean and Fefe, between Fefe and Jean, and in this uh, golden and glamorous uh, Hollywood. And, and that's, the, that's the story that the reader will, will find in, in Starring His Eyes, this um, continuing reshaping his identity. Sean, you want to talk about how clearly that theme connects with the passage you just read and the King of War <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this whole book is about is about identity. Um, it's about the identity of the narrator, um, who, as we hear, sort of. So the book is set in in Warsaw in uh, in 1937, just before the Second World War, at a time when the city was about a third Jewish. Um, and the narrator tells the story of you know coming out of a religious Jewish household, becoming a secular, you know, a non-religious Jew under sort of the influence, the mentorship of this man who he later finds out also killed his father. Um, but the narrator tells this story looking back on it in his 80s from Israel long after the war, you know, and, um, and as the book goes on, we realize that his identity is not, is not only not what we think it is, it's not even what he thinks it is. So there's a level of personal identity going on, but there's also political issues of identity. You know, this was a period of really intense anti-Semitism in Poland. Um, so there was a societal division between ethnic Poles and Jews in the country. But even within the Jewish community, there were huge divisions between religious and secular, Yiddish-speaking and Polish-speaking, Zionist and non-Zionist. And all of these issues are kind of are reflected in the characters of this book and intersect with one another in really interesting and really challenging ways. Um, it's about um, so much of the book is about Shapiro's attachment to Warsaw, um, and yet his Jewishness is pulling him in all of these different directions. His, you know, his his career and his his background as a criminal is pulling him in other directions. And the fact that the country is really falling apart in the years leading up to the war is also pulling everyone in all kinds of different directions as well. So it's re it really is a book about identity in lots of different. I love the way both of these characters sort of shape their identities around uh, really visible goalposts. You know, there's these like cultural figures like Frank Sinatra and James Dean and uh, the neighborhood boxer tough. And I think it really is easy to see why a person might choose those tropes and those really visible characters to, to sort of stake a claim on while they're trying to identify themselves as something they can respect. Uh, maybe we can talk for a second about respect, because I think actually both of these books really do wonderful work at identifying what in the community looks like respect and what people do that actually uh, ends up deepening and enriching the community. You know, Jean Leon ends up becoming wildly well respected because he actually zeroes in on the restaurant business and wine and becomes a really deep expert. And I think in The King of Warsaw, we see that a lot of the respect that's um, around in pre-war Warsaw is is sort of bloated and uh, conceit and not really necessarily founded on on any kind of depth of connection to the subject matter of boxing or to the subject matter of uh, what's what's happening in town. Um, is there is there something there in terms of respect that these these novels are are sort of chasing at? Well, uh, in fact, I think that uh, Jean Leon uh, works for uh, this respect because he knows that when he uh, came into this wall, it's not his wall, but uh, he pretends to be uh, his wall and he pretends to be one of this community. Uh, and he uh, began um, from the, the very low uh, level uh, and he, I think that he, he began this a working uh, process uh, to be respected and, and to achieve this respect uh, among this, uh, uh, this community 
with a, a very strong sense of uh, faithfulness and friendship. I think that um, we uh, can uh, understand that uh, he is respected once he has uh, opened La Scala, the restaurant there in the heart of Beverly Hills, and then when he achieved to, uh, to elaborate his own wine, coming back uh, to Spain and to Catalonia and to a very a concrete region, uh, which is a very well-known wine region, or Panadés, very close to Barcelona. Uh, but he, um, uh, he works for this respect because, um, for example, when he designed the, 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 the restaurant with James Dean and then uh, he's um, building up his dream with Emilio Nunez, the cooker, and his wife, uh, Donna. He's uh, gathering a lot of uh, people who uh, can, with their experience, uh, that can give uh, to him this, um, I think, this kind of um, respect that he wants to look for, um, which is a, a person with values, with sacrifice, uh, very stubborn with his ideas. He will do everything to achieve them, uh, even mm, doing not very well, uh, not very right uh, things. Uh, but he at the end, will deserve this respect because uh, those people recognize in him one of, uh, one of them. And he became a self-made man. He became one of them, one of the community. And then that's why they decided to respect because he achieved his goals. He achieved what he uh, wants to do. He achieved his dream at the end. Yeah, I think that in the King of Warsaw, respect is a huge is a huge topic in the book. And there's even a scene where Shapiro goes to the market that the gangsters control and goes from person to person and all these passers-by greet him by saying, respect, Mr. Shapiro, respect, Mr. Shapiro. And I think for the gangsters, respect is about being a source of power, right? Um, these guys are, in a funny way, they're like folk heroes. They like they throw feasts for the common people of Warsaw, and they, you know, they look out for the little guy. Um, and uh, they're like they're the subjects of like folk ballads that like these street singers come up with, you know. Um, but all of that is, you know, is sort of a form of soft power that allows them to then like enforce their rule over these ordinary people, but it's also a source of political power because one of the things that was going on in Poland at this time was there was, as the political system fragmented, um, these gangs effectively affiliated with different political movements. Um, and so I think one of the things that goes on in the course of this book is, you know, Jakob Shapiro wants to be the king of Warsaw by owning that respect that allows him to then exercise hard power. And that desire and that sort of strategy, if you like, comes up against the, the drive for political power on the part of, in the case of this book, radical right-wing elements um, in, in Poland at this time. And uh, the clash between those two is really at, at the core of this book. And you know, spoiler alert, but it doesn't go well. <laughs> yeah, John um, Lane is the only happy ending in this. <laughs> 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 but I, I decided just to uh, just to explain a, a part of his life because yeah. in fact uh, I could decide to uh, as as Sean did uh, like a flashback, no? Uh, when he, he when this this Hollywood is going down and all his friends are retiring or are not uh, these celebrities that they were, uh, he decided uh, uh, to to run away and he go to Thailand. Uh, he will buy a boat and he will he will he, he will go to Ta to Thailand and then he opened there uh, another restaurant another La Scala and and he um, he, he 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 died in Los Angeles um, but uh, he was retired there in Thailand and I was uh, at the beginning of of the writing uh, I just was doubting if uh, to begin the story with uh, that man there in this. Um, uh, in this retirement and thinking back, remembering what he has achieved, was what what he what what he was, uh, what he became, and now what it was there in the in Thailand. That's why I'm saying that I just uh, explain a, a portion, a, a little bit of of his story, of Jean Leon's uh, successful story. 
Well, I think both of these books in the spirit of San Jordi could make great gifts. I think we might be surprised uh, who the right recipient might be. Marty, you want to tell us a little bit about the San Jordi uh, results of Stars in His Eyes last year? Well, I'm, I'm very happy because uh, it was the, the, the bestseller of uh, this San Jordi and it was the, the book that everyone wants to have and then wants to read and I realized it because I went then a lot uh, with presentations and readers clubs and a lot of uh, performances but together with uh, Pep Poblet, uh, he was uh, performing the, the songs, the music that appear on, on the book, Fly Me to the Moon, Diamonds Are Girl with Friends, New York, New York, the soundtrack of uh, On the Town, for example, or Me and My Shadow, the, the last song. And uh, I think that uh, I, I'm, I'm really uh, enjoying, uh, including this San Jordi, although it's in a rare uh, circumstances. I uh, I have a lot of um, videos to record and um, proposals that I have been receiving uh, from stars uh, in his eyes. La Forza del Destino, La Forza del Destino, because it's in Catalan and Spanish, both both editions. And I'm very happy because, um, in fact, the story is about uh, a humble man, a self-made man, a dreamer, and. I think that everyone has dreams to achieve and to, uh, and to become real. And that's what the story is about. And I think that's a book that, can, uh, that you can give to anyone because, um, tell me, there is um, one single person that didn't have dreams. So uh, here you have, uh, I think, a good example uh, how to achieve your dreams. And it's inspirational book in, in a certain way, you know, because you can... Um, I think because I have received a lot of opinions during these two years that the, the book is out uh, on the shelves and on, the, on people's houses. And people uh, sometimes told me this, that it's, it's an inspirational book, that it helps me in more than, um, in, in several ways. No? So that's for me, it's, it's very, uh, very exciting. I don't know if it's appropriate, but I kind of feel like The King of Warsaw is an inspirational book in a different way. Uh, Sean, who might you recommend The King of Warsaw as a gift for? Uh, well, the book is coming out this week, so of course everyone should, should buy one copy for themselves and then another copy for, for a loved one or a friend. Um, but I think that, you know, what drew me to this book was that this is a, um, uh, this is a fascinating period in, in history, not just in Polish history, but in European history and in world history. And it's one that I think there's a certain amount of um, maybe mythology about in Poland, this period is certainly very romanticized. And I love that this book gives us not only an unusual perspective on that history, not only sort of an underdog perspective on that history, but also gives us a lot of different lenses to see it through in the forms of the different characters and their different perspectives. And even in the case of the narrator, you know, um, multiple perspectives within our, our, our one unreliable narrator. And so I think that it's, um, as much as it's a very particular book about a particular time and a particular place, I think certainly for anybody who's a big fan of history, this will be an interesting book. And for anybody who's interested in the way that a set of events can be seen in lots of different ways by, by lots of different people. I think that's a book that'll, that'll speak to them too. I think that might be where I got the idea of inspirational from. I find string theory and multiple <laughs> universes inspiring too. But, but let me say, Gabi, let me say that uh, not only for dreamers, but uh, for the ones that wants to know uh, more about the, the real life of the celebrities, of how um, James Dean suffered for, uh, I don't know, for the lady that didn't, that, that cannot be his, his one, his, uh, uh, his girlfriend, or how, uh, how, for example, um, reacts uh, Marilyn Monroe, uh, or uh, how, um, how can you imagine that uh, Paul Newman um, was uh, once uh, uh, James Dean uh, died? And th that's the possibility with uh, John Leon's eyes, with one of us. It, it, it's just one of us just behind the, the, the curtain and you can see uh, the real life of the, of the stars. That's wonderful. Thank you both. This has been such a treat. 
Um, you know, San Jordi happens to fall on the U.S. celebration of World Book Day, which is April 23rd. And I wanted to also mention that Amazon Crossing does a giveaway every year for World Book Day uh, since 2018 with a selection of nine books, uh, all of which were translated into English with the goal of spreading translated literature to a broader audience. Last year, Kindle customers in 158 countries downloaded, downloaded over 3 million books during the week-long promotion. Um, so it's sort of a digital version of the book in a rose, but it's uh, ongoing now through April 24th if you visit amazon.com slash read the world. Mm -hmm. And now we're gonna hear from Sean about a Polish song to lead us out today. Thank you guys so much for this wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. Uh, yeah, I figured since we started with some music, I'd like us to end with some. Uh, in, in Poland between the wars, the most, the, the, the most popular form of popular music was the tango, funnily enough. Um, for about 20 years, Warsaw became like this global center of tango music. And so I'm gonna play a, uh, we're gonna play here for you a modern rendition of one of the most famous tangos from this period, um, Ostatnia Niedziela, uh, which means the last Sunday. Um, this is sung by Olga Avigail Mileszczuk, who specializes in Polish and Jewish music from this period. Many of these popular hits were written by Jewish composers and drew very heavily on, uh, on Jewish musical traditions. And uh, she's actually going to sing the song in a bilingual version in, uh, in both Polish and in Yiddish. Um, so uh, I really hope you enjoy it. And you can find her on YouTube. Uh, her name's a little hard to spell, but if you just Google Olga Avigail, which are her first two names, it'll come right up. So I hope you enjoy it. Teraz nie pora szukać wymówek Fakt, że skończyło się Dziś przyszedł drugi, bogatszy i lepszy ode mnie I wraz z tobą skradł szczęście me Jedną ma prośbę Pierwszą od wielu lat Daj mi tę jedną niedzielę Ostatnią niedzielę A potem nie gwali się świat It's ten szczęść pejt jest Zupy na tej rec It's it's szoń na sferbę Gdy kumenic du Baroj ptcho termi svej visaj. Bloj soba koše vih der lage. Ej ne ris nit cu fil. Gib mi že bloj s noh en šabas. Dem let stik en šabas. Der noh so zain gen vis a vil. To ostatnja nije. Dzisiaj się rozstaniemy, dzisiaj się rozejdziemy na wieczny czas. To ostatnia niedziela, więc nie żałuj dla mnie, spojrzyj czule dziś na mnie.
Good bye.